Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in this world. Welcome to Sunday Church Bible Study. And this is our homepage, focusonthekingdom.org. If you're new to this live stream or recording, we have many links of magazine you can look at, published every month, free online podcast as well, where Anthony reads many of his articles and books. We have a conference, as I have put up before, beginning soon, 34 days from now. This is online only, a free online conference. You can watch, access through here, theologicalconference.org. And there's the schedule on the homepage. <clears throat> And we start once again Friday, April the 5th, 7 p.m. Please look out for that. Uh, let's see what else. We have the humanjesus.org, christenemylove.com, jesuskingdomgospel.com. Other websites there tailored for specific uh, topics. Okay, as usual, we begin with the Shema, and Anthony will lead us in prayer. Then we have a youth lesson from Sarah, and Anthony will read from one of his articles on John chapter 1. But before then, uh, here's Anthony to lead us in prayer. Good morning, Anthony. Hey, good morning, Carlos. And indeed, we always put the Shema at the beginning of our program because Jesus said his words that this is the most important command of all. There's no command as important as this, and it urges us to believe that the Lord our God is one person, one Lord. That's what the Greek of the New Testament says. That's the correct way to translate this. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God is one single person. That's very, very important because God expects to be honored as the sole unique creator of everything all by himself. If you've created the world, you have a right to be jealous against all contenders and rivals. And so we don't want any rival challenging the unique position of God, who is the one and only true God. John 17, 3. You, Father, Jesus said in his closing prayer there, are monos elithinos theos. That's the Greek, and I'm using the modern Greek pronunciation because our Greek friends like that. The Lord our God, the Father, is the only one who is true God. I hope you understood that and take that into the coming week with joy. And your brain will like that simple idea. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And Echad means one. There's a prodigious falsehood out there which tries to kid you into thinking that one is really what they call compound one. Oh, no, no, no. One is one. It's the cardinal number one, echad, one single, not more than one. So with that in mind, then, I would ask you to bow your heads or to look up to heaven, whatever is your practice, and we'll invite then the great God of the universe, the judge of all mankind, to bless us in our efforts this morning. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for this miracle of technology and especially for the talents of those people who operate this system so well, enabling us then to be in contact with friends around the world in different countries. We ask you to bless every single one of them this morning, each family, that they would be inspired and led into a greater depth of truth, that they would understand the gospel of the kingdom better than they did before. And above all, that they would understand the opening words of John's gospel where we're going to show that the one God is still the one and only God there. So that will be, I think, a, a fun thing to look at this morning. We ask you, Father, to help us and all those who listen to have clarity and a complete consciousness of the truth and the power of truth, which leads to salvation, to indestructible life in the future kingdom. We ask you to bless us now and uh, strengthen us. Give power also to the lesson that Sarah will be giving as a so-called young person's lesson. 
bless us now, strengthen us, and bring the time soon when the devastating weapons which now destroy human life on such a grand scale will be beaten into farm implements and garden tools. That guns will be a thing of the past and that they'll be replaced by garden tools and farm implements. We pray this prayer as we do, resurrection day by resurrection day, Sunday by Sunday, beginning of the week. We pray it in Messiah's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Anthony. Anthony will be back. He'll be reading from his paper on John 1. I posted the link in the chat. Before then, we have a youth lesson from Sarah. Uh, first of all, you remember maybe a month ago, we talked about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and what happened to them. They were told, everyone in the land was told to bow down and worship a golden statue. But of course they refused because that would be wrong, even though everyone around them was doing it. And they were thrown into the furnace of fire, but God sent his angel and rescued them. This story is similar. So I want you to think about how this might be similar and how it might be different while we go through this story. And if I call it a story, I should say it's in a historical account. It's not a made up story that somebody just wrote down. This actually happened. So let me give you a little background to Daniel. This is in the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. Daniel was with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were all taken captive from Israel, taken to the land of Babylon. Let's see. Daniel was so good in the government that the king, the king was this time was King Darius, not Nebuchadnezzar anymore. So he was made head over one of three over 120 different governors over the kingdom over the whole land but daniel was over the 120 he was one of three supervisors of all the governors so he's very high up and he was distinguishing himself so well he did so well that the king was intending to make him head over the whole land next to the king of course but of course this made the other governors and supervisors very jealous they had to think of something to do with Daniel. So these supervisors and governors were trying to find an accusation against Daniel in connection with government affairs, but they were unable to find any damaging evidence because Daniel was trustworthy and he wasn't guilty of any corruption. So these men concluded, we won't find anything against this man, Daniel, unless it is in connection with the law of his God. So they went to the king, some of these men, these governors, and they said, oh, King Darius, live forever. To all the supervisors of the kingdom, it seemed like a good idea for a royal edict to be issued. For the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human other than you, O oh king, should be thrown into a den of lions. So let the king issue a written law so that it cannot be changed. So the king did. He did what they asked. So what did Daniel do? When Daniel knew that a written decree had been issued, he continued kneeling three times a day, praying and giving thanks to his God, just as he had been doing previously. Then those officials who had gone to the king plotted together and they went and found Daniel praying and asking for help before his God. You can see them on the right side of the picture there. They found Daniel praying just as he always did. He knew what the right thing would be to do would be to continue praying. And notice also that he was giving thanks. You would be amazed how many times it says that we're supposed to give thanks in scripture. Obviously not just once a year on Thanksgiving, whether we celebrate and have a big meal or not, we're supposed to give thanks all the time to God. Okay, so they found him praying. And of course, they went to the king these three, these men. Did you not issue a law, O king, that for the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human other than you, O king, would be thrown into a den of lions? The king replied, that is true, and the law cannot be changed. They, were, they had a very strict law that if the king issued a decree, it was set in stone, it could not be changed. So then the men said, Daniel, who was one of the captives from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the decree which you signed. Three times daily, he offers his prayer. 
When the king heard this, he was very upset and began thinking about how he might rescue Daniel. Until late afternoon, he was struggling to find a way to rescue him. But then those men came and said, remember, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and the Persians that no edict or decree that the king issues can be changed. And this was true. The king was stuck because it couldn't be changed, even though he made the law himself. So the king had to give the order and Daniel was brought and thrown into a den of lions. Now this would have been a pit underground where the lions were, where people were actually thrown in. The king said to, to Daniel, your God, whom you continually serve, will rescue you. Then the king went off to his palace, but he spent the night without eating and no entertainment was brought to him. He was unable to sleep. Meanwhile, Daniel was in the den of lions. In the morning at the earliest sign of daylight, the king got up and rushed to the lion's den. As he approached the den, he called out to Daniel in a worried voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, was your God whom you continually serve able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel spoke to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and closed the lion's mouths so, so they have not harmed me because I was found to be innocent before him. Innocent before God. Then the king was very pleased, of course, and he gave an order to haul Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was hauled up out of the den. He had no injury of any kind because he had trusted in his God, which is pretty amazing. The angel was sent to close the lion's mouths and Daniel was not hurt at all. So the king sent a letter to his whole kingdom. He said this, peace and prosperity. I have issued a decree that throughout all my kingdom, people are to respect and fear the God of Daniel, for he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His authority is forever. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. Wow, King Darius here even knows about the kingdom. Somewhat, his kingdom, God's kingdom will not be destroyed. God's kingdom will last forever, unlike King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom or King Darius or any other king, God's kingdom when it comes in the future will never be destroyed. It will last forever. What are the similarities between Daniel, Daniel's account and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? Um, here's some that I thought of. Number one, both Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego were told something that was against God. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were actually told to do something. They were told to bow down and worship a golden statue. That would have been wrong, clearly. Daniel was told not to do something. He was told not to pray to God, which is ridiculous. And of course, he didn't follow that. Okay, number two, both did the right thing, even if they would have to suffer for it. Remember Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, God can save us, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down, and so we'll be thrown into the fire. And number three, of course, in both cases, God sent his angel and rescued them. So what can we learn from Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Number one, always do the right thing, no matter what others around you are doing, even if everyone around you is doing the wrong thing, you do the right thing. And of course, like Daniel, don't ever stop praying and giving thanks, of course, to God. All right, good reminder there, never to stop giving thanks in the good and the bad times, of course. He gives and takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Okay, we are now going to Anthony and he will read from his article. You can find under uh, articles and go scroll down to let's see under jesus there you see and the article is called john 1 1 caveat lector reader beware and there's a pdf and i'll post it again in case you don't see it and uh, anthony will start on page two on the online document and it's all yours anthony okay thank you carlos 
we're going to talk about John and his understanding of so-called pre-existence, meaning that he believed in the pre-existence of a purpose of God, not a literal pre-existence of the Son of God, which of course would make two gods and we all know, I think, from the Shema, there's only one God. So that's our premise today. John and the pre-existent purpose of God. I say this, one day a theological storm is likely to erupt over the translation, in your Bible probably, of John's prologue, the first 18 verses of John's Gospel. That's to say the translation found in our standard versions. At present, the public is offered a wide range of renderings from the purely literal to the freely paraphrased. But my question is this, do these translations represent John's intention or are they traditional based on what, so to speak, everyone accepts? That's a fair question. Have they sometimes served as a weapon in the hands of Christian orthodoxy, so-called? to enforce the decisions of post-biblical, that's after the Bible, creeds and councils. I'm sure then that you listening today are seekers after the truth in the Berean style of Acts 17.11, and therefore you should investigate all things carefully. According to the findings of a recent monumental study of the origin of Christ in the Bible, Bible readers instinctively hear the text of John 1, 1 as follows. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with God, and Jesus was God. Or, in the beginning was the Son, and the Son was with the Father. This reading of the passage provides vital support for the traditional doctrine of a Trinitarian Godhead shared equally by Father and Son from eternity. Paraphrased versions, there are many of them around now, sometimes go far beyond the Greek original. The paraphrased versions sometimes go far beyond that original Greek text. The contemporary English version, for example, interprets John to mean that two beings were present at the beginning. The word was the one, this paraphrase says, the word was the one who was with God. No doubt, according to that translation, the word with its capital letter there would be the equivalent of an eternal son. It would certainly be understood in that sense by those who have already been schooled in the post or after biblical creeds. But why Kushel, and I'm referring now to his wonderful work on pre-existence, Kushel, a, a marvelous read, by the way, Born Before All Time is the name of his book. But why Kushel asks, correctly, I think, why do readers leap from the word to son? It doesn't say in the beginning was the son. It doesn't say that. It says in the beginning was the word. The text simply reads, in the beginning was the word. Notice I didn't put a capital W on word because there's no capital letter there in the original Greek. And you're being misled if you've got a capital W on word. And it certainly doesn't say, in the beginning was the son. The substitution of son for the wonderful word, word or logos, which for millions of readers appears to be an automatic reflex They've gotten so used by tradition and by habit of reading the word son there, this influences vastly most Bible readers. But the text doesn't warrant that switch. Again, John wrote, in the beginning was the word. Notice I didn't put a capital W on word because it never, ever had a capital W on it in any of its occurrences in the Old Covenant Scriptures, what we call the Old Testament. John did not write, in the beginning was the Son of God. There is, in fact, no direct mention of the Son of God until we come to verse 14. That's very striking. Until we come to John 1, 14, there's no mention of the Son of God at all. Where the word, 
not the sun, but the word, lowercase w, became flesh, a human being, and lived among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory of a unique son. This is Jesus walking in the land of Israel as a missionary, as a great prophet, as the unique son of God. And he, Jesus, was full of grace and truth. But note this, until verse 14, there's no mention at all of a son. The son is what the word became. But what is the word? Imagine I told my child now, our car, our vehicle, was once in the head of its designer. And now here it is in our garage, or garage as I would say in England. The child might respond, how could that car possibly fit into the head of the designer? It would be too big. It's a fair point, isn't it? But based on a large misunderstanding. The application to our situation and problem in John 1, 1 is simply this. The fact that the word became the man Jesus, the Son of God, does not necessarily or automatically imply that Jesus, the Son of God, is one-to-one -one equivalent to the word before Jesus' birth. What if the word, which really means the self-expression of God, God expressing himself, what if that self-expression of God became embodied in, was manifested in the human man, Jesus? That makes very good sense of John 1.14. It also avoids the fearful, never resolved complexities of so-called Trinitarianism, by which there are two or three who are fully and equally, they are fully and equally God. That doesn't sound right to you, I hope. You recognize that that contradicts the Shema, which we were just reading and reciting. If our theory is right, John will have been speaking about a pre-existing divine purpose, a word, lowercase w, not a second God or a second divine person. It's commonly known to Bible readers that in Proverbs 8, wisdom was with, and the Hebrew word there is etzel, and the Greek is para. Wisdom was said to be with God. That's to say, God's wisdom is personified, treated as if it were a person, but not that it really was a person. It wasn't that Lady Wisdom was really a female personage alongside God. We accept this sort of language usually without any confusion. We do not suppose that Prudence, also mentioned in Proverbs 8.12, who is said to be dwelling with wisdom, we don't think that she herself was literally a person. And I recall this interesting fact when the famous St. Louis Arch, St. Louis Arch, was finally completed after several years of construction, a documentary film announced that, and I quote, the plan had become flesh. That's to say, the plan on the drawing board had turned into a reality when the arch was built. The plan, in other words, was now in physical form. But the arch is not one-to-one -one equivalent with the plan on the drawing board. The arch is made of concrete, and the plans were drawn on paper. So, the misleading capital on word in your Bible, probably. Here's a very remarkable informative fact. If one had a copy of an English Bible in any of the eight English versions available prior to 1582, one would gain a very different sense from the opening verses of John. You would read this, in the beginning was the word, lowercase w, please note, and the word, lowercase w, was with God, and the word, lowercase w, was God. All things came into being through it, I see, and without it, nothing was made that was made. Yes, all things came into being through it, the word. A word is not a person until that word is embodied in Jesus, the human being. So all things came into being through it, the word, not through him, as mistranslated. 
and to those English versions. And so those English versions did not rush to the conclusion, which perhaps you have, as does the King James Version of 1611, influenced by the Roman Catholic Reims Version of 1582, and its followers, that the word was a person. That's what they're trying to get you to believe, the Son of God before the birth of Jesus. If all things were made through the word, as an it, a quite different meaning emerges. The word would not be a second person existing alongside God, the Father, from eternity, because that would make two gods. You would have God the Father and you'd have God the Son. That breaks the most important commandment of all. The result, one of the main planks of traditional systems about members in the Godhead would be removed. The Trinitarian idea would be removed immediately if we would lower that capital W on word and call it word, meaning plan, meaning wisdom, meaning an idea, self-expression. There's more to be said about that innocent sentence in the beginning was the word. As I've said, there's no justification in the original Greek for placing a capital W on word and thus inviting the readers to think of a person. That's the so-called interpretation which you have imposed on the text. You've added it to what John wrote, but was that what he intended? The question is, what would John and his readers understand by the word word? Quite obviously, there are echoes here of Genesis 1.1, where you read in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and later on, God spoke. There you have the idea of God's word when God spoke. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, using his word, his self-expression, let there be light. And God said means, of course, God uttered his word which is the medium or the tool of his creative activity, his powerful utterance. Psalm 33 verse 6 says it exactly, had provided commentary on Genesis. We read there in Psalm 33 6, by the word, lowercase w, of the Lord, the heavens were made. And so in John 1, 1, God expressed his intention, his word, his self-revealing, his creative utterance, but absolutely nothing in the text of the Bible there, apart from the intrusive capital letter on word in our versions, turning word into a proper noun, nothing apart from that illegitimate capital W would make us think that God was in company with another person or son. The word which God spoke was in fact just the word of God, God's self expression, God's expression of himself. And one's word, you know that, is not another person. Obviously, you don't need a degree in theology to understand that. I'm speaking words to you now. This is uh, an expression of what I'm thinking, but it's not another person. So next section, the meaning of word. Sensible Bible study would require that we attempt to understand what word Logos is the Greek word. What would this mean in the background of John's thinking? Commentators have long recognized that John is thoroughly Hebrew or Jewish in his approach to theology. John, as the other New Covenant scripture writers, are steeped in the Hebrew Bible, what we call the Old Covenant scriptures, Genesis to the end of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament scriptures. Hebrew Bible word had appeared, catch this now, some 1,450 times, plus the word speak, about 1,140 times, massively had occurred in the Hebrew Bible, known so well to John and Jesus. The standard meaning of word is utterance, promise, command, and so on. But it never, ever, ever means a personal being, never means the Son of God. Never did it mean a spokesman or spokesperson, 
Rather, word with lowercase w generally signified the index, the indicator of the mind, an expression, a word. There's a wide range of meanings for word according to a standard source. However, the word person is not among those meanings. The word for word in the Hebrew Bible is davar. There it is, the noun davar, meaning word, occurs about 1455 times. In legal context, it means a dispute. And I've given you examples there. And uh, it means other things too, verdict or claim, transfer and provision, otherwise request or decree, conversation, report, text of a letter, lyrics of a song, a promise, annals, event, commandment or plan, as in Genesis 41, 37 and those other verses there. Language, that's what word means, language, not another person. Daniel 9, 25, decree of a king also thing or matter or event of particular theological sig significance is the phrase the word of the lord came to notice no capital w on word there god's word god's communication came to a prophet and so on in judges 3 19 to 21 ehud delivers a secret message a sword in that case to kill him. Yahweh commands the universe into existence, let there be light and so on. Yahweh tells the truth so everyone can rely on him. The word of the Lord has power because it's an extension of Yahweh's knowledge, character and ability. Yahweh knows the course of human events. When I say Yahweh, of course, I mean the Lord God and the New Covenant Scriptures make no issue at all about pronouncing that word in Hebrew. You can say the Lord God, you can say Yahweh if you choose, but don't make any big deal out of that. Similarly, human words reflect human nature. The mouth speaks from the abundance of the heart or mind. Words are used for good or evil purposes. We all know that, Proverbs 12, 6. Words, we know this very well, can cheer, can correct, can depress even, and they can also calm people down. We might add this one too. I like this text very much. We might add that as a man thinks in his heart and as he speaks, so is he. You are what you say. Your words are a reflection of who you are, your character, and so on. Proverbs 23, 7. A person then is his word, so to speak. We might not put it that way, but that's the way the Hebrews think. In the beginning then, there was the word, Judge John 1, 1. That is the word of God. Clearly, John did not say that the word was a spokesperson. God was the speaker of that word, the one God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. Word had never, not once, had word ever meant a spokesperson. So it's very, very poor Bible study to introduce that idea of the word being a person when it had never had that meaning in the background scriptures, what we call the Old Covenant scriptures. Of course, the word can become a spokesperson, and it did when God expressed himself in a son by bringing Jesus onto the scene of history. So then Hebrews 1 verse 2 says, note this carefully, God, after he had spoken long ago to the fathers, notice after, not at the same time as speaking to the fathers, but after he'd finished speaking long ago through the fathers in the prophets in many portions, many ways, at the end of these days, God has spoken in a unique son, Jesus. The implication is, of course, that God did not earlier speak through his unique son, but later, after Jesus was born, of course, he did. There's an important chronological distinction between the time before the son and the time 
after the sun. There was a time, the Bible says, when the sun did not yet exist. It would be a serious mistake of interpretation to discard the massively attested meaning of word in the Hebrew matrix from which John wrote and attach to it a meaning it never ever had, i.e. a person, second member of the divine trinity. No lexicon of the Bible, of the Hebrew Bible, ever listed davar, the Hebrew word for word, as a person, either God or an angel or man. So then the word was with God, we read. John's prologue continues, and the word was with God. So read our versions, and so the Greek might be rendered, if one has already decided, against all the evidence, that by word John meant a second person, the Son of God. Alive, according to this very false theory, alive before he was born. In other words, older than himself, which is a very strange concept if you think about it. Allowance must be made for Hebrew idiom. Without a feel for the Hebrew background, as so often in the New Testament, we're deprived of a vital key to understanding. We might ask our English speaker, when was your word last with you? Plain fact is that in English, which is not the language of the Bible, a word is never with you. A person can be with you, certainly, but not a word. But in the wisdom, so-called wisdom literature of the Bible, a word certainly can be with a person. And the meaning is that a plan or a purpose, a concept, a word, is kept in one's heart, ready for execution. For example, Job says to God in Job 10.13, if these things you have concealed in your heart, I know that this is with you. The New American Standard Version gives a more intelligible sense in English by reading, I know that this is within you. That makes it very clear. The NIV reads, in your mind. But the Hebrew literally reads, with you. Again, in Job 23, 13 and 14, it's said of God, what his soul desires, God does. For he performs what is appointed for me, and many such decrees are with him. Meaning, of course, that God's plans are stored up in his mind. God's word is his intention, held in his heart as plans to be carried out in the world he has created. Sometimes what God has with him is the decree which is planned. With this, we may compare similar thoughts. This is the portion of a wicked man from with God, from God's intention, that is, and inheritance which tyrants receive from him. I will instruct you in the power of, move up the screen there, please. I will instruct you in the power of I will instruct you in the power of God. What is with the Almighty, I will not conceal. Job 27, 11. We should also consider the related concept of wisdom now. In Job, we find this. The deep says, it, wisdom, is not in me. And the sea says, wisdom is not with me. Job 28, 14. To have wisdom or word with one, is to have them in one's mind and heart. With him is wisdom, we read, and strength. To him belong counsel and understanding, Job 12 verse 13. And of course, wisdom, as to say, lady wisdom, a personification, but not a real person, was with, Hebrew word etzel and para in the Greek, was with God, wisdom was with God at the beginning, Proverbs 8, 22 and 30. In Genesis 40, Verse 14, we read, Keep me in mind when it goes well with you. And the text reads literally, Remember me with yourself, to say in your mind. From all these examples, it's clear that if something is with a person, it's lodged in the mind, often as a decreed purpose or plan. Paul remarked in Galatians 2, verse 5, very important verse here. 
Galatians 2 verse 5, that the gospel of the kingdom, that is, of course, the gospel might continue with them. The word there is pros, exactly the same word as we have in John chapter 1, verses 1 to 2. Pros, with. It was a divine plan, reflective of his inner being, close to the heart of God. John is fond of the word is, but it's not always an is of strict identity. John says that Jesus is, that Jesus is the, and we need to move up for us, the resurrection. Did you get that? Jesus is the resurrection. He says, I am the resurrection. John reports that God is spirit. God is love. God is light. Compare that all flesh is grass. That's just a very Hebrew way of speaking. In fact, God is not actually one to one identical with light and love. And Jesus is not literally the resurrection of the dead. The word was God means that the word was fully expressive of God's intention and his mind. We're getting to the mind of God here with that wonderful word logos, Hebrew word davar, English word word. A person is, so to speak, his mind. Metaphorically speaking, Jesus is the one who can bring about our resurrection. And John would express that by saying, Jesus is the resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and so on. God communicates through his spirit, John 4.24. The word is the index of God's intention and purpose. It was in his heart, expressive of his very being. I think you'll get the idea now. As the translator's translation senses the meaning, the word in John 1.1 1, 1 was with God and shared his nature, shared the very character of God. It wasn't another person, though. The word was divine. The word, then, is the divine expression, the divine plan and purpose the very self of God revealed. The Greek phrase theos enologos in John 1, the word was God, can be rendered in different ways. The subject is word, logos, but the emphasis falls on what the word was, God. In other words, John is trying to tell us the word was not another person. The word was God himself, an expression of God. And there, Theos has no definite article, stands at the head of the sentence. God here is the predicate of that sentence. The word was God. The word wasn't somebody else. John is trying to provide a safeguard against the false readings of our verse, which followed in post-biblical times. The word God, Theos there, in John 1.1 1, 1, 1, 2, has a slightly adjectival sense, which is very hard to put that exactly into English. John can say that God is love or light. This is not an exact equivalent. God is full of light. God is full of love, characterized by light. I think that D uh, D David in the Psalm says that he himself is prayer. Well, David is not equivalent to prayer exactly, but it means that David was doing nothing but praying. The word is similarly a perfect expression of God in his mind. The word, we might say, is the mind and the heart of God himself. John therefore wrote, in the beginning, God expressed himself. Ah, there we have it. Not, in the beginning, God begat a son. That imposing of later creeds on the text has been responsible for all sorts of confusion and even mischief, even killing. Some actually killed others. Can you imagine that? Over the issue raised by the meaning of John 1.1, 1, 1, the issue of the so-called eternal son, which makes Jesus very much less than human. You cannot be human unless you start in the womb of your mother. That makes perfect sense. And Jesus did that. Okay, how are we doing? Uh, good. Just some comments. Yes, sir. If you don't mind. Oh, no, fine. Uh, Nancy says languages such as Spanish, Italian, French, etc., yes, yes. have grammatical gender. Of course they do. How important do. Yes. is that to understand? And to well, it's very important as long as we we are aware of the fact that grammatical gender 
is not the same as sexual gender. The word word happens to be masculine grammatically, but it doesn't mean the word is a person. So let's get this quite clear. Grammatical gender, which certainly French and Spanish and German have, is not the same as sexual gender. A child, for example, technon in Greek is a neuter word. That doesn't mean a child is an it. So again, I repeat, grammatical gender is not the same thing as biological gender. Okay, nice comment there from Nancy. Thank you. Yep, and um, I think you've made this point. Uh, yeah. The phrase God is one. Yes. In the Greek, the uh, word for one is is. Hmm using the modern Greek pronunciation yes. or heis, if you're yes. using the Erasmian. Yes. And in the masculine, you have said, in the masculine gender, this is the equivalent in English of saying one person. Yes. So are you yes, saying that every time you read God is one or there is one God, yes. uh, you can read into that the writer making the statement that Certainly. God is one person? Yes, absolutely. If you have singular pronouns, God is a he. Somebody said very appropriately the other day that God gets to choose his own pronoun. There's a very reference to some of the transgender nonsense that we are confronting today. God chose to describe himself as I, me, myself. And he's referred to as he, him, himself. None beside him. Now, every child learning to speak English, at least, understands what that means. So, yes, when you say God is one, is, the Greek word is is, which is the cardinal number one, it certainly doesn't mean compound one. No dictionary or lexicon of the Bible will give you compound one. They won't even know what that is because it's nonsense. Every item in the universe is compound, it's made up of molecules or other features, of course, but that doesn't mean that one is compound one. That's just completely without any grammatical understanding at all. It means one single person. And just to double up on that, God speaks of himself as the only God. You'll find that in John 5, 44. God is the only one who is God. And in John 17, 3, the Father, Jesus said in his final high priestly prayer there, you, Father, are the only one who is true God. Is that clear? If I am the only Anthony speaking to you from my study here in Georgia, that means that nobody else is Anthony speaking from Georgia and in my study. That's clear. This is not difficult. It became a nightmare of confusion. And and finally, people said, well, it's all a mystery. You can't understand that because God is so remote and difficult that we cannot define him with words that have meaning for us. We have to reject that, I think. Okay. Um, we have a, um, mm. from the Ryrie Study Bible. Yes, good. The word logos means word, thought, yes. concept, the expression thereof. Yes. In the Old Testament, the concept conveyed activity and revelation, mm -hmm. and the word or wisdom of God is often personified. Psalm okay. 33, 6, mm -hmm. uh, by the heaven, uh, by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, I believe. Yes. And Proverbs 8, where you have Sophia or wisdom as a woman, as a she. Yep. Um, how important is this concept of personification to the writer of John here? Is he really relying on, on that type of style of, of Old Testament writing? I don't need, I don't think we necessarily have to say he's personifying the word logos in John 1.1. 1, 1. It's simply God's expression. And that expression turned into a human being when Jesus was born. So you don't need to get uh, involved in some complicated arguments about personification. Certainly, wisdom is personified. Lady wisdom is not a person. Lady prudence is not another person. That's very clear. The important thing is the Shema, the most important command of all, says that God is only one person. Write to your Jewish friends, consult the rabbi, and they will tell you, the Jews understand that to be a unitary monotheistic statement. 
And the brilliant thing is that Mark, in Mark 12, 29, actually has Jesus affirming that Shema, agreeing with a fellow Jew, would you believe it? Isn't that good evidence? Here we have Jesus being asked by a fellow Jew, hey, Rabbi Jesus, tell me, who is the one true God? And Jesus recites the Shema. That's in agreement with a Jew. Isn't it going to be a little embarrassing if on Judgment Day people say, well, I didn't really like that one God idea because I'd learned a different tradition. I wouldn't go there. If you want to follow Jesus, it might be good to sound like Jesus and you might want to start with the greatest of all the commandments, reciting Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, and found there in Mark 12, verse 29. Okay, good point from Riley there. Yep. Uh, we have a question here, mm. a bit long, and um, is Asclepios yes. serpent the actual deity called Logos or the Gnostic Plato Logos that Justin Martyr to Origen were obviously inspired of, and that is the foundation of the unbiblical trinity? Or mm. what do you think God, deity, they worship as Logos identity is? Who is it exactly? Is the logo Sophia serpent for the Gnostics, including Valentinian and Sethian? Sethian, yeah. Sethian. Well, I think that the influence of Gnosticism is what the Bible worked against. And so it is a fact that most pagan religions have triads. There's a book by a Welshman called Griffiths on trinities and triads. And he's shown that most pagan religions have some sort of triune God. Unfortunately, I think the church fathers who were not paying attention did not realize that they were being drawn into a Gnostic pagan idea of God. The danger of that is it makes Jesus not human. You cannot be human if you don't begin in the womb of your mother. That's what human beings do. They begin in the case of Jesus, supernaturally, of course, by sheer miracle, you have to begin in the womb of your mother in order to be a descendant of David. You can't be a descendant of David if you're older than David. That's not going to work well, is it? I would think that would be a very unfortunate way to go. So pre-existence, so-called, is a very complicated and difficult thing. And Trinitarianism eventually said, well, it's all a mystery. We can't understand it at which point we have to say words have ceased to have meaning and the Bible cannot communicate well with us. So it's a good question. Uh, a few, yes. A few comments here. Uh, English used to have gender, mm. uh, grammatical gender. The words him, her, etc., are leftovers of that. Yes, that's true. We have genders in our pronouns. Him is masculine, her is uh, feminine, of course. That's exactly right. We don't though, assign a gender to every noun in English, but that's a good point from Ben Chandler there. Thank you. Uh, Dan Shaw, a major problem mm. has been theologians have Hellenized Jesus and his message. Yes. Hijacked from Jewish meaning to Greek. Absolutely, that's a very good point. And let me add, if I may, this. The church fathers who did the damage decided to define God as one in nature and not one in number. They said that. If you look at Basil in his eighth book, one of the church fathers, he said, we're defining God as one in nature. Well, guess what? The Bible defines God as one in number. So on their own admission there, they said, we have launched into the world of Greek philosophy and language. No wonder then all the confusion. So that's a great point from Dan Shaw. Yep. Um, okay. Yep. And uh, Ramon, if mm. God the Son has a God, does God the Father <laughs> have a God also? That's a good point. God the Son is a completely unbiblical phrase. There's no such word as God the Son. The Son of God, yes, but turn it backwards and you've gone outside the Bible. This is not difficult, provided you start with the Shema. The Lord, our God, is one Lord. That's the correct translation of the Greek and the Greek of the Old Testament, the Greek of the New Testament. The Lord, our God, Kyrios, Theosimon, 
Kyrios is esteen. The Lord God is one single Lord. So don't be caught by the clever trap which says that one is really compound. For example, they say Adam and Eve were one flesh. That proves that one means more than one. It doesn't. It doesn't begin to do that. If you say, for instance, that one zebra or zebra, however you pronounce that, means that one means black and white. It doesn't. You're making a very elementary, childish error in order to justify what you want to believe. The one is echad in Hebrew means one. And now there's another prodigiously wrong argument out there which says that if God was really a single person, he would be yachid, another Hebrew word. Well, the word yachid in scripture is never used of God. Quite unsuitable for God. It means kind of lonely on your own. It often means a one, one of a kind son. That's not at all correct for God. So there are numbers of attempts to justify the use of different words than the Bible to justify this thing we call the Trinity. Okay. Um, one last thing, Anthony. Yes. Uh, you mentioned uh, God is spirit. Mm. It doesn't mean he is incorporeal any more than God is love means he is a feeling. No, that's true. God is spirit means God is spiritual. It has an adjectival sense. God works in the realm of spirit and not flesh, of course. That's exactly right. So yeah, language is tricky. Many, yes, it's true. Many uh, reference that verse uh, in oh, do they? John. Yes. Uh, God is spirit. Yes. And uh, as if it means God is like some kind of a blob or... Yes. Uh, an usia or an yeah. essence in person uh, or non-personal no, 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 no. i don't even know no. but yeah the meaning is is not that god is spiritual god is adjectival own. meaning that's a very good point god is yeah. spiritual he operates on the level of spirit in, in communicating with us extends himself through his spirit which is not another person any more than my spirit is coming to you now my inward thinking and so on expressed, all of that is not another person. So those are good points. It's a big study, uh, but relax and enjoy the show. Yep. Well, one last thing to recommend. Yes, yes uh, please. We got a question about the yeah. philosophy, Gnosticism. Uh, mm. Here's a good book I always recommend, yes. The Philosophy of the Church Fathers. Absolutely. Uh, volume one by a uh, scholar called Harry... Wolfson, he was yes. a philosopher, a philosophy and Hebrew scholar in uh, Harvard mm -hmm. back in the 50s. Yes. And I believe you can still read this for most of it for free on Google Books. Good. Uh, it was published uh, some time ago, as you can see, 1956. Mm -hmm. But it's a very instructive uh, history yes. lesson more than Wonderful. a theological, if you will, treatise. Yes. But he goes into the history of uh, mm -hmm. the connections between so-called Gnosticism or even other forms of uh, paganism yes. that uh, seeped into the uh, early Christian uh, yes. system, Anthony. Very good. Yeah, I recommend that as a good read. It tells you exactly where the church fathers went wrong. They decided to mix the Hebrew Bible with the pagan Greek philosophy and that's a very dangerous unwanted mixture so good yes by wolfson yeah you can see that chapter yes. one actually opens mm. with the uh, wisdom of god issue so good very very um, good thank you do you want to continue reading your yes absolutely articles? let's go a little further please the disturbance of monotheism one godism the great difficulty which faces those who say there was a God the Father in heaven, while God the Son, so-called, that's not a biblical phrase, but you find it in churches, God the Son was on the earth, is it implies two gods, doesn't it? You have, this is a chair, and this is another chair, that makes two chairs. You don't want to talk about two gods. There was, on that theory, a God who did not become the Son, and a God who became the Son. This seems to us to dissolve the unity of God. It undermines and com compromises 
the first commandment, which we've mentioned and mentioned it Sunday by Sunday. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, Mark 12, 29. It also flies in the face of the great statement of Isaiah that God was unaccompanied. This is a powerful verse. Unaccompanied as the creator. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. Okay, I am the Lord. How many persons is I am? I'm the Lord who made all things, who stretched out the heavens alone, who spread out the earth. Who was with me? Implied answer, that's a rhetorical question. Who was with me? Implied answer is absolutely no one. I was unaccompanied. And the book of Hebrews says that God spoke in the past time through various prophets, but only in the last time. Only when Jesus showed up did God begin to speak through Jesus. Of course, of course, if one has taken a first false step by assuming that the Word in the beginning was the Son, then the phrase the Word was God can only confirm the impression that there are two members of the Godhead, both of whom are somehow one God. However problematic and illogical this leap into a duality in God may be, Bible readers have been conditioned long years of habit and reading uh, translations of the Bible with a capital W on word, they've made that leap despite the impossibility of understanding John 1.1 1, 1 to mean the Son was the Father. That's what you'd have to do. If you think the Son is the Logos there, then you'd wind up saying the Son was the Father. That wouldn't make any sense at all. No Trinitarian believed that, but to avoid it, he must assign a different meaning to the word God in John 1, 1, C, then he has given it in 1, B, where he distinctively, instinctively, I should say, hears, and the Son was with God, equals the Father, and the Son was the Father? No, 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 that's not going to work. So just logically, the solution we're proposing for you is going to be much easier. The whole idea of a duality of persons in John's prologue contradicts Isaiah's statement that no one was with God in the beginning. The fact, that fact, I would say in itself, should have prevented translators from thinking that the word Logos was another person alongside the Lord God. Moreover, any introduction of a second divine being into John's prologue is at the cost of contradicting what Jesus later said Jesus elsewhere proves himself to be a staunch believer in the unitary monotheism, God is one person, of his great Jewish heritage. Addressing the Father, Jesus said this, without any doubt, you, Father, are, I'll give you the Greek here, the monos, alithinos, theos, the only one who is genuinely God. That should be very clear. And you can add in your notes there, John 5, 44, where Jesus spoke of the one and only God. So unitary monotheism, God is one single person, is not abandoned by Jesus or by John. We really do not need an army of experts to help us understand that simple sentence. Jesus refers again to the Father as the one who alone is God in John 5, 44. These are echoes of the pure, strict, monotheism of the Hebrew Bible and thus of the Jews for centuries. God remains in the New Testament, the God and Father, as somebody just pointed out, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There it is, some verses for you. Jesus had and has a God, and Jesus, his own God, is the Father, the one and only God of John 17:3. How exactly like the Old Testament that is. Here's a good verse for you. Malachi 2.5. Do we not have all one Father? Has not one God created us? You see the parallel there. One Father equals one God. You are great. You alone are God. Psalm 86.10. You alone, whose name is the Lord, are the most high over all the earth. Psalm 83.18. How beautifully... This harmonizes with Paul's great creedal declaration for us Christians. There's one God. He could have said, there's one God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He never imagined it. Paul 
as many good writers have said, would not have understood the Trinity, had never heard of it probably. There's one God, the Father, and none other than He. 1 Corinthians 8, 4, 6. That too is an unambiguous statement about how many persons there are in the Godhead. Only one. Jesus is Lord now. Let's finish with this today. Theology has tragically tried to disturb this simple truth. It has been argued that Jesus in 1 Corinthians 8 verse 6 is called one Lord. And that's absolutely right. He is. But if the Father is the only one who is truly God, logically it's impossible for Jesus also to be that one God. Jesus is indeed the unique Lord, but in what sense? Lord, in what sense? This is where the celebrated Psalm 110 verse 1 comes in to reveal precious, very precious truth to us. That verse wins the prize for being the most frequently mentioned Old Testament verse in the New Testament, along with Daniel 7, the Son of Man, very popular too. But this verse is massively quoted in the New Covenant Scriptures, shows it's very important. Psalm 110.1 is referred to some 23 times in the New Covenant Scriptures, and by implication, many times more. In that Psalm, the one God, Yahweh, Jehovah, if you want to call it Jehovah, Yahweh, the Lord God, speaks to David's Lord. Notice the lowercase l there. In the Hebrew word is Adoni. Adoni, not Adonai. So I hope you learn this morning once and for all that Adonai means the Lord God. Now Adoni, you can hear the difference, Adoni, which appears 195 times in the Old Testament, never refers to the one God, not ever. The custodians of the text, the Jewish people who copied the text meticulously, they were very careful to distinguish between the God Lord and all other superiors. The Lord God, the Lord God that is, is called Adonai about 450 times, all of its occurrences, while a human and very occasionally an angel, those superiors are called Adonai Ask any Jew and they will tell you, say, do you know the difference in Adonai and Adoni? They'll smile at you and say, well, of course. Adonai means God and Adoni means not God. So there it is in Psalm 110.1. Once again, the translators took liberties and put a capital letter in English for Lord in Psalm 110.1. And only in that verse did they capitalize Lord. That's trickery, what we would call a crime scene. Jesus is indeed the one Lord Messiah. Luke 2.11, you're going to use that verse all the time. He's the one Lord Messiah. He's not the Lord God. To give him his full title, he is the Lord Jesus Messiah. The Lord Messiah Jesus. Very Jewish and very easy. The anointed king. But he's not the Lord God, since there is only one in that category, John 17, 3, 1 Corinthians 8, 4 to 6. How fearfully complicated and illogical it is to have one God, the Father, in heaven, or supposedly another, who is equally the one God, walks on the earth. Would that not amount to two gods? How impossibly difficult it would be to imagine that the Lord Messiah, Luke 2, 11, who expressly said, that he did not know certain things. How amazing to imagine that he was actually at the same moment the almighty, all-knowing, omniscient, omnipresent God of the universe. On that amazing theory, the speechless baby in the manger was also at the time, at the same time, upholding the universe with his unlimited powers. To that sort of imaginative fantasy, the church has been committed, we think, for far too long. John 1.14, the wisdom and the word of God expressed. We propose then that John's meaning is as follows. In the beginning, there was a divine word, lowercase w, and it was stored in God's heart or mind. And it was his own creative self-expression. All things came into being through that divine word, and without it, 
not without him, but without it, nothing was made that was made, and the word or plan or proposition became flesh in John 1.14. That's when Jesus showed up, having been born miraculously in his mother Mary. This was realized in a human person. So Jesus is the walking word, if you like. He's what the word became, just like the water was turned into wine. And guess what? The wine was not water after it had turned into wine. They're not equivalent. The word became wine, and the logos, the mind, and the expression of God became a human being, exactly parallel. Jesus thought of his own activity as the expression of wisdom with which he equates himself. I'm sending you prophets, he said, and wise men and scribes. The same saying is reported by Luke. For this reason, the wisdom of God said, they have it, the personification of wisdom. Lady wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles. Jesus indeed is indeed the expression of the power of God and the wisdom of God, 1 Corinthians 2. So some help then from many modern scholars who understand what we're saying. Contemporary scholars are coming to the same conclusion about John's opening words. Here are some readings of John 1, 1 and 14 and comments which do not require that the word is a person before the birth of Jesus. Here we have it. In the beginning, there was the divine word and wisdom as a translation, the complete gospels. The divine wisdom and word was there with God and it was what God was. Another translation. In the beginning, there was the message. The message was with God and the message was deity. He was with God in the beginning. I'd rather have it there. Could be confusing. Next one, at the beginning, God expressed himself. Of course, that personal expression, that word, was with God and was God. And he existed with God. I don't like the he there. Obviously, it's the expression that is with God from the beginning. In the beginning was the word, the logos, the expressed concept. There it is, the expressed concept. And that purpose was revealed in a historical encounter like that one. The word said John became flesh. We would put it in another way. The mind of God became a person. C.C. Torrey translates John 1, 1 and C. The word was God with a little g. It has the quality of God, but it wasn't another person. The professor aims with this rendering to tell us that the word has the quality of God but is not identical with another God. Torrey's sensitivity to the nuances of the Greek is shared by James Denny, who discussed the clause, the word was God. These are famous writers, uh, probably most of them late now. They have died recently. As we all remark, James Denny says, that you missed an unequivocal statement that Jesus is God, I feel inclined to say, says James Denny, that such a statement, Jesus is God, seems unattractive to me, of course, just because it's impossible to make it unequivocal, to make it absolutely clear. It's not the true way of saying a true thing. The New Testament says that theos in o logos, the word is God. It doesn't say o logos in o theos. The word was the one God. And it is this last which is really suggested to the English mind by Jesus is God. Probably the version I have to such an expression as Jesus is God is linguistic, is linguistic as much as theological. His objection is language wise. We are so thoroughly monotheistic now. Well, we're not actually. We're pretending to be monotheistic. That the word God, to put it pedantically, has ceased to be an appellative and become a proper noun. It defines the being to whom it's applied. And in Greek, in the first century, it was quite different. You could say, Jesus is God with a capital G, but not a God, but a being in whom is the nature of the one God. It's a little complicated. You can ponder his words there, but they're in the right direction, of course. Jesus is God is the same thing as saying Jesus equals God. 
And Denny doesn't like that, nor do we as biblical Unitarians. Jesus is a man as well as God. That's not exactly right. In some ways, therefore, both less and more than God. It's getting complicated. We don't need to burden you with any more of that. So finally, then, a most enlightening comment comes from Dr. Norman Krauss. Dr. Krauss commends the translation of J.B. Phillips and deplores the rendering of the Living Bible, which gives the impression that Jesus himself was alive before his birth. That's the one thing you cannot be. To be alive before you are alive is not a comprehensible statement. He says, the word expressed in Jesus is a self-expression. I like this quotation, the self-expression of God. Thus John tells us that from the beginning, God is a self-expressive God. Aren't we thrilled that he is? not transcendent or far off, not aloof, as in the Greek Neoplatonic philosophical thought, which greatly later on influenced the orthodoxy of the fourth and fifth centuries. God is not hidden, revealing his will only in written form, as in the Islam's Quran. Neither is he the silent reality, which can be discovered only in the discipline of meditation beyond all human rationality, as in the practice of Zazen in Buddhism, how different the whole meaning of John's gospel would be if the first verse I'd read in the beginning was Satori, enlightenment. Yes, in the beginning, God enlightened us all with his word. It's interesting that a translation was made as early as 1795 by Gilbert Wakefield, which rendered John 1, verses 3 and 4, all things were made by it, and without it, was nothing made. The same translation rendered the first verse of John in the beginning was wisdom. There we have it. There's no doubt that from that point of view, we have a Jewish background correctly. Jesus was a Jew, thinking like a Jew. Wisdom and word carried similar meanings than wisdom and word are equivalent. A distinguished member of the team of scholars who produced the revised version of the Bible in 1881 noted that word means divine thought manifested in 114 in a human form in Jesus. He rendered verse 3 as, and we're about to finish it here, he rendered verse 3, let's move up a little bit for the next page, in it was the life and the light of men. A leading British expert on the text of the Bible, Dr. Hort, admitted that even in John's Gospel, there's no clear statement that the Son of God existed before his historical birth in Bethlehem. A pre-existent fatherhood and sonship within the Godhead, as distinguished from manifested sonship in the Incarnation, with a capital I meaning when Jesus showed up at the beginning of his existence, the other Trinitarian idea is nowhere enunciated by John in express words. So these examples from the pens of leading Christian analysts of the Bible show that it's entirely legitimate to think of word as God's utterance, not his son at that stage of history. The son is in fact what the word became. Thus the son is the visible human expression of God and God's pre-planned purpose. There was no son of God until the Messiah was conceived in history. Before that, God had his, had his design and God's plan with him in his heart. So finally, when did the son of God begin to exist? Luke had no doubt about the reason and basis for Jesus being entitled to be called the son of God. It was as a consequence as a result of the supernatural miracle wrought in the womb of Mary, that Jesus is truly the Son of God. Luke wrote this, For that reason indeed, the okay, Jesus will be called the Son of God. For what reason? The miracle worked in the womb of his mother. That's why Jesus is the Son of God. Luke did not believe in an eternal or pre-existing Son. The Son was supernaturally conceived in history when Mary became pregnant. Matthew was careful to note that what occurred in the womb of Mary was the creation 
the coming into existence, the begetting or the beginning of the Son of God. So there you have it. Matthew one twenty states that what is begotten, mistranslated as conceived, is what not what the mother does here, but what God produced by way of father, what is begotten or fathered in her is from the Holy Spirit. At that moment, and not before, God became the father of his unique son, Jesus. Finally, other New Testament writers proclaim the same truth about how God finally spoke in a son in New Testament times. Jesus is the fulfillment of the greatest of all God's promises. Paul wrote to Titus about the knowledge of the truth in the hope of eternal life, life in the future kingdom, which God, who cannot lie, promised long ages ago, but at the proper time manifested, namely his word or gospel word of the kingdom in the proclamation of that gospel of the kingdom. Salvation comes to us according to his own purpose, which was granted to us, the purpose that is, in Messiah Jesus from all eternity. But now, in the present time, has been revealed by the appearing of our Savior, Messiah Jesus. Well, I hope that gives you a better sense then of the scheme of John 1.1. 1, 1. By all means, invite your friends to read this and see if that would make good sense. F.F. F. Bruce, famous uh, late F.F. Uh, F. Bruce, who corresponded with me many years ago, the noted Bible scholar F.F. F. Bruce questions a traditional translation of John 1.1 1, 1 with these words. F.F. F. Bruce said this, on the pre-existence question, one can at least accept the pre-existence of the eternal word, should be a lower cap capital there, not word capitalized, the eternal word or wisdom, which, and he puts, does it mean a who or a which? He's uncertain. He's favoring our idea here, that which, that plan, that purpose became uh, incarnate in Jesus. Finally, Professor Cupid, a long-term schoolmate of mine many years back. John's words ought to be retranslated. The word was with God, the Father, and the word was the Father's own word, not his own son at the beginning. To stress that the word is not an independent divine being, but is the only God's own self-expression. If all this is correct, then even John's language about Jesus still falls within the very important model and scope of a king ambassador model. God is the king. Jesus is the agent or ambassador of God. The considered views of these leading Christian thinkers show that it's sufficient to think of word, lowercase okay, w, is God's utterance, not his son, prior to the begetting of the son in Mary. On this model, the son is in fact what the word became. The Son does not pre-exist as Son. The Son is the visible human expression of God's preordained purpose. There was no Son of God until the Messiah was conceived in history. Before that, God has his design and his plan with him. That's very clear. As the basis of his whole intention for creation and for mankind. On this understanding, the Messiah is truly a human being, a status which cannot be claimed for him if he has really been alive since before Genesis. Finally then, if John's unity with or opposed to the rest of the New Testament, let's harmonize now with the rest of the New Testament. If we read John and his introduction in this fashion, we find him proclaiming, unitedly with other gospel writers and the rest of the New Testament, the supremely important fact that Jesus is the Messiah as Son of God. On that great truth, the church is to be founded. So Jesus said in Matthew 16, verses 15 to 18, and the church would be united on that marvelous truth and for that single purpose to demonstrate 
and urge belief in Jesus as the Messiah. Guess what? That's what John wrote his whole gospel for. John 20, verse 31. Notice carefully, the Messiah is the human Lord of David, Psalm 101, the Son of God, and that there's only one God, John 17, 3. So that's the story for the morning. I hope you'll find this useful. And by all means, pass this message on to many of your friends, and they will enjoy reading um, what I think we've put together here. Okay, Carlos, let's leave it at that point, I think. Uh, yep, was just going to show yep. here the other article. Good. People can, so yeah, you can read the rest, just a yes. few pages left. Yes, good, thank you. Uh, but there's also the article on the translations. Yes. Go to the article section under Jesus. Yes. John 1 in 50 plus <laughs> wow. English translations. Yes. You can also yes. have a read at if you want to say anything. Yep. last about that mm, good any last words about the this one this uh, article no i think we're what we're trying to establish that god is a single person the father that is biblical monotheism your brain is going to like that your children will enjoy a simple explanation you father are the only one who is the genuine true god john 17 3 along with the shema which we repeat resurrection day by resurrection day so by all means give that some thought as a berean and see if that doesn't fit your thinking at some simple level all right thanks anthony so check that out and uh, before we go a couple of quotes from some very well-known trinitarian scholars and this is uh, colin brown uh he was at fuller to be called son of God in the New Testament means that you are not God. It's a common but patent misreading of the opening of John's gospel to read it as if it said, in the beginning was the son and the son was with God and the son was God. What has happened here is the substitution of son for work and thereby the son is made a member of the Godhead which existed from the beginning. And another one from the famous uh, British scholar G.B. Caird in his book, New Testament Theology. How is John 1 1 to be translated? The solution is that logos for John primarily means purpose. In the beginning was the purpose, the purpose in the mind of God, the purpose which was God's own being. It is surely a conceivable thought that God is wholly identify, identified with his purpose of love and that this purpose took human form in Jesus of Nazareth. So these are well-known Trinitarian scholars, not uh, so-called Unitarians or Sassinians, biblical Unitarians, and just giving you their uh, example of nothing new under the sun. This is an interpretation that even some of our very well-known opponents have held through the centuries, if not the last century. So. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us. <clears throat> uh, your prayers appreciated for everyone out there suffering from any other ailments, any healings needed. Of course, we believe in the power of prayer and miracles. And of course, for the coming kingdom and pray for the church first. Uh, Father, we thank you for this time the ability to do this in safety and luxury. We thank you for all those viewers today that they may be blessed by uh, the Gospel of John and, and of course your son. Father, we pray for the, uh, the wars and the continued conflicts and uh, the savagery and violence of not only our local communities, but just the world at large, and continue to pray. May your kingdom come as we await your will to be done on this uh, planet and across the nations. And we always pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
God bless everyone until we meet again.